we're really pleased to have four people with us this evening who can share information and knowledge about the way community housing sector provincial organizations function in British Columbia, Quebec, and in New Brunswick. And we will introduce our presenters in turn. But before we do that, I would just like to share a land acknowledgement. Jenny, are you able to, to put our acknowledgement up on the screen? There we go. So the St. of X Extension Department acknowledges that we are gathered today in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And we are particularly grateful for the peace and friendship treaties that govern these lands. And we embrace opportunities to work respectfully with our indigenous neighbors and friends uh, to honor this beautiful, this beautiful earth that's been gifted to us. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional lands of our panelists in, in New Brunswick and Quebec and in British Columbia. And I would certainly invite you to enter in chat uh, the, the name of your traditional lands as a way of acknowledging uh, the presence and the respect that we, we share for all of these lands of our Indigenous peoples. I also want to acknowledge that among our team and our panelists this evening, uh, we are striving for, for equity and inclusion and representation. We know that we're not quite there yet, but please rest assured that we are working very hard in the Build Together project to ensure that we are opening spaces <clears throat> that are welcoming for all people, all people who are impacted by the issues uh, surrounding housing, uh, insecure housing, homelessness, precarious housing, uh, that the community housing sector faces in all of our locations uh, here today. The purpose of this evening's session is to share with folks uh, in Nova Scotia who've been part of the Build Together project or people who are just tuning in for the first time, what we're learning about how provincial uh, community housing sector organizations uh, are structured and how they function in other places. As we know, the Build Together project is all about strengthening the community housing sector in Nova Scotia. And we've been, we've been tasked or we've heard from people who are doing this work that it's really important for us to work together in a more coordinated fashion with more collaboration, more sharing of resources. So we're really pleased to have an opportunity to hear how this happens in three other provinces in Canada this evening. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague from the, the uh, Community Housing Transformation Center, Renee Hebert, uh, who is a, a partner in this work in the Build Together project. And Renee is going to introduce our speakers this evening. Renee? Thank you. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for participating this, uh, this evening. I'd like to introduce the first panelist. His name is Brian Clifford and Brian is a program manager at the Community Housing Transformation Center. His uh, region territory um, is British Columbia and he's been with us since earlier this summer. However, he, prior to his employment, he worked for the BC Nonprofit Housing Association for seven years. Uh, Brian, uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Renee. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, well, yeah, thank you for uh, that introduction. Um, I think uh, just to provide a bit more context into the, the kind of perspective that I'm lending to the conversation today. Um, I, I did spend seven years at the BC Nonprofit Housing Association um, before joining the center just uh, about a month ago. Um, I was working kind of on the policy research and advocacy end of things. Um, so that's really the, the kind of perspective that I bring. Um, you know, I'm gonna be talking about kind of the organization of BCBHA uh, writ large, um, but just to, to let you know that I'm uh, coming at it from, from that perspective. Okay, so I'm going to structure um, the conversation today um, based on these uh, 
these buckets right here. So I think that this has kind of been the, uh, the overriding framework of how uh, this process has gone thus far. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how BC and PHA embodies each of these uh, pieces, talking a little bit about the values and beliefs, um, the funding uh, picture of BC and PHA, um, how it works to build capacity among nonprofit housing providers in BC, um, its provincial organization, and to talk a little bit about um, policy development, how it contributes to policy development. So I'll begin by uh, talking about the values and beliefs. And uh, I think the best way of kind of showing this is really to articulate the um, vision statement of BC and PHA, which is a safe, secure, and affordable home for everyone. And what I think is really important about this is that um, it, it really speaks um, not to just kind of a narrow need for, you know, housing low income folks or um, housing folks from uh, other socioeconomic backgrounds. It's really uh, broad and inclusive. So implicit here, I think, is this understanding that housing is a human right. And I think that really informs a lot of the um, the mission statement of BC and PHA, which is uh, to empower BC's nonprofit housing sector through advocacy, education, and support. So, you know, while the mission is to, to focus on uh, this for the nonprofit housing sector, BC and PHA is also concerned with um, advocacy, education, and support for the affordable housing sector writ large in British Columbia. So um, a lot of my conversation it is going to be talking about the, the advocation, education, and support. And I just wanted to give a little bit of um, context into some of the activities of what BC and PHA does provincially. So um, in my wheelhouse, uh, research and advocacy is a big component. So um, just to, to provide a couple of examples here of some of the major initiatives that the association has led in the last several years, um, the Canadian Rental Housing Index. So if uh, you haven't checked that out, I, I would uh, recommend it. It's a large database of rental housing statistics to quantify housing need. Um, so rentalhousingindex.ca, you can go to that website and check it out. Um, back in 2017, we did an affordable housing plan um, uh, that basically articulated costed targets using a lot of housing data um, that was used as an advocacy document to uh, really push um, the agenda on housing policy provincially. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on in my presentation as well. Um, in addition to the research and advocacy, BC and PHA provide education and events. So they host uh, a variety of webinars every single year. Um, they put on uh, housing, the Housing Central Conference, which is Canada's largest affordable housing conference. Um, and they also do regional conferences, which basically um, bring together individuals and, and groups from uh, different parts of the province to talk about regional issues, to network and to collaborate. Um, BC and BHA also provide uh, programs. They, they do uh, bulk purchasing to uh, save costs on goods and services. Um, they offer property management services, asset management services, and um, I'll be talking a little bit more about those um, as I go through my, my presentation here. Um, and also member engagement. So this kind of is tied into the education a little bit, but uh, it, it provides the opportunity for members to come together to talk about um, issues facing the sector, um, to, to have dialogues about that and uh, to really you know, problem solve collectively. Um, and part of that is also doing consultations on the variety of policy that comes up provincially um, or on, you know, uh, advocacy matters, things like that. So moving on from kind of the activities, I, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about the funding picture of BC and PHA. So what I've done is really put together the, uh, the revenues for 2020. Um, to give you an understanding of the, the kind of uh, revenue streams of how the organization is funded. Um, so as you can see here, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the first six rows um, because they're really the, the most important here. Um, but really partnership programs lead the way in terms of revenue generation for the association, um, coming in at about 40% of the total revenues in 2020. Um, Given this is so, such a big part of the funding picture, I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail in my next two slides um, about some examples of partner programs that the association puts on. 
Um, asset management. So the association uh, has been working in partnership with various utility companies uh, based in, in BC to uh, develop funded positions that help with, uh, you know, going out to nonprofit housing societies and helping with the uptake of energy efficiency measures with understanding the energy um, consumption of the sector writ large. Um, events registration, I, I just mentioned Housing Central Conference and uh, the regional conferences. Well, there's uh, uh, basically registration fees associated with that. So that's another um, revenue generation. Um, research and education, that's, uh, you know, research grants to, to conduct, uh, you know, the types of projects that I just mentioned. And sponsorship and trade shows. So there's a funded uh, position at BCPHA to work to get, uh, you know, conference sessions uh, sponsored, to get the events sponsored, which is another form of revenue. So these five buckets kind of all told um, constitute almost 90% of the 2020 revenues of the association. So it's just these five activities. And I, I highlight that because what it shows is that only 7% of the, the revenues come from membership dues. So while BC and PHA is really a uh, you know member organization, it's for members. Um, it's not driven solely by the membership uh, dues. So that's uh, important to keep in mind. So given that partnership programs are really uh, you know important for the the revenue generation, I just wanted to articulate some examples. I'll be doing this at a very high level and. Um, what I might do kind of a little bit later is just put in some uh, more resources into the chat so that uh, you can find out more uh, information on these respective programs. But the first one I wanted to talk about is the uh, PI program, the Pooling for Increased Earnings. So this is a, a partnership that was uh, fostered between BCMHA and a couple of locally based credit unions in the province. And basically what it offers is the opportunity for BCMHA members to aggregate operating accounts into a large pool, uh, making them eligible for higher interest rates uh, on, the, on their deposits. So really it's kind of taking advantage of economies of scale um, and, get, and getting uh, you know, the collective nonprofit sector to work together for uh, benefit. And so this is a big program. Um, as you can see there, the, the collective and city pool is now valued at over $400 million uh, provincially. The next program I wanted to talk about is uh, the BCMPJ Telecom program. So this is a, a partnership with BCMPJ and uh, a large service internet and uh, TV service provider based in BC, TELUS. Um, so they provide uh, savings of up to 40% 40, 40 off retail rates on individual services for tenants of member nonprofit uh, housing providers. So basically the nonprofit signs up, um, you know, with their, with their uh, tenants and you know you're able to get a 40 percent reduction off market rates which is you know awesome for various low income uh tenants that uh, tend to reside in low in a uh, nonprofit housing okay so i mean i've alluded to some of these but uh i, I wanted to talk just a little bit about the the initiatives that bcpj engages in to build capacity uh in the sector provincially so I mentioned previously, you know, there's education and events. So, you know, there's a, a wide offering of webinars, anything from, you know, how to manage staff burnout, um, you know, understanding the different funding and policy programs provincially. Um, we do a variety of online courses. So one that comes to mind is called Ready, Set, Build, where if you have a nonprofit who's just kind of getting started, they want to develop a housing project, they can take that course and really get some of the fundamentals of learning uh, the development process. Um, as I mentioned, the, the conferences and events, uh, there's also networking opportunities that, that provide and opportunities for people to kind of come together and, and build capacity. So I mentioned the, the asset management services. Um, really, this is uh, focused on you know, energy benchmarking and auditing. Um, you know, really understanding the, the energy use of various buildings, um, doing building condition assessments, um, and, and working with the nonprofit to get them signed up for, you know, energy retrofit and rebate programs, those kinds of things. 
Um, I also mentioned capital planning right there. So, you know, working with the nonprofit society to uh, uh, plan for the long-term use of, of capital assets and capital replacement. And then, uh, you know, various member support. So um, just as a couple of examples here, uh, one of the things that I was doing right before I left the association was developing a policy template guide. So that provides um, basically uh, templates of policies that uh, nonprofit societies would use in daily operations uh, related to a vast array of um, items like governance and, and maintenance, uh, you know, a bunch of different things there. I can put a link into the, uh, the chat if you want to look at that a little bit more. Um, they offer job matching services to, to pair, um, you know, job seekers with jobs in the nonprofit housing sector. Uh, through COVID, we were offering, you know, a summarization of all the vast uh, array of programs and policies that were coming out of the COVID supports. And things like, um, you know, working with boards for uh, equity, diversity and inclusion training, that kind of thing. So I'm going to talk uh, just very briefly about kind of the, the provincial organization of uh, BC and BJ. Um, so it's really, it's broken into four administrative regions, um, the lower mainland, the interior, the island and north. And the board membership is made up of um, two members which are elected from each region. And then there are four at-large members. Um, the board is uh, elected at uh, the annual general meeting and they're elected on rotating three-year terms. And the purpose of it is it, it's really a policy governance board. It's not an operational board. It really sets the strategic direction of the organization uh, for the staff to implement. And then uh, finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, um, the opportunities for policy development and how, how the association kind of influences policy. So really a, a huge part of that is research. And, um, you know, research does a lot of different things within the context of the organization, but uh, just some of them here are, are really to identify the problems that are facing the sector, um, you know, to quantify housing need and demand uh, provincially, and uh, to, to kind of understand the investments that are needed uh, provincially to solve the homelessness and housing crisis that we are facing in the province. So really the research, it's used as an evidence base to back up the advocacy. You know, we're in a, a era of kind of evidence-based policymaking. Um, and so really having a strong research base helps to make the case for informing um, advocacy and, and being convincing in that advocacy as well. And then uh, also there's a variety of consultations that happen provincially as well. So um, BC and PHA will consult with membership, um, you know, on various policy pieces as they, they're coming from the federal or provincial or municipal governments. Um, we'll also frequently uh, connect our membership in with uh, government and non-government stakeholders for consultation um, on a variety of, of policy uh, decisions. And just to, to kind of uh, drive this home a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about a uh, example that I previously mentioned. Um, so back in 2017, BCBJ led the development of an affordable housing plan provincially. Um, so this was uh, right in advance of the uh, provincial election in 2017. And what that did is it, it brought together uh, a range of housing data to articulate costed targets of what we would need to meet the housing crisis and the homelessness crisis in BC. And what we were able to do with this document is get a lot of the stakeholders working in and around the rental housing sector and rental housing space to endorse it. So we got the private landlord associations, we got um, the Cooperative Housing Federation of BC to uh, support the document, um, a lot of tenant organizations to come in and that, that made for a very powerful um, you know, pitch to the government when we released this, this plan uh, to, the, to the respective parties, I should say, who were running at the time. And uh, we were able uh, eventually to get a lot of these recommendations contained in the plan uh, put into the, the NDP's budget of 2018, including the commitment to build um, 114,000 units of affordable housing over a 10 year period. 
So um, that's just one way uh, of, you know, kind of the research informing the advocacy uh, uh, here. So that was a very, you know, high level overview. We only had about 10 minutes for this. So um, I'm happy to kind of field any questions after all the other panelists have gone, but uh, just want to thank everybody for, uh, for your time. Thank you, Brian. That's great. Um, next is our second panelist is Luc Labelle. And Luc is also a program manager at the Community Housing Transformation Center. His territory is Quebec, and he's been with the center since it opened two years ago. Uh, Luc started his career in community housing uh, with the provincial association called Le Réseau Québécois des OSPL d'Habitation. So thanks, Luc. Take it away. Thank you, Renee. Um, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? We yeah. can see okay. it. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, as uh, Renee mentioned, I worked uh, previously for the, um, the Réseau Québécois des OSBL d'Habitation, RQOH, or Réseau means network, so I might call it uh, the network also along the, this presentation. Um, before, in, in that previous job, I was uh, doing a lot of different things, but mainly I, I was uh, leading uh, sort of rescue plans for housing providers facing uh, closure. That was uh, a new initiative that was uh, put uh, into place. Uh, I will uh, talk about it a bit um, later in, in the presentation. Of course, as a provincial association, um, a lot of things will uh, resemble uh, what Brian uh, presented. Uh, but one of the um, uh, main difference will be the, the structure of that association. So uh, we can go through. I've uh, slightly uh, changed uh, the structure of the presentation, but you will, uh, I think, find um find it interesting so in terms of value of course um you know the values carried by, by the association is those of social justice democracy solidarity and the belief in autonomy of action of local groups so that is really key the first mission is to represent support and work with regional federation of nonprofit housing organization in Quebec. So uh, I will highlight, you know, how the association is structured. But this first mission is to represent those regional federation, um, and um, you know th that will be the, the main difference. I, as I said, of course, the organization also carries the mission of promoting development and sustainability of nonprofit housing providers in the province and promoting the right to housing and to be housed in quality social housing and also um, gives a, a lot of uh, weight to uh, um, giving the tenant uh, a place to to voice out his need in, in that um, that model of development so in terms of structure of the network uh, so i've talked about regional federation. So um, each of those federation might cover one or uh, more uh, of administrative region in Quebec. Um, so uh, of course, there is two um, bigger uh, federation out there, Montreal Federation and Quebec City Federation represent um, 250 uh, members and 170 uh, members. Um, and you can notice that there's one administrative region that is not represented by a federation. So for the, that uh, region and, and you know, maybe exception elsewhere, uh, members, so local housing providers can um, get a membership directly to the network. Um, so in this case, it's, it, it would be the network representing them. So in terms of uh, board membership, you have one person per uh, regional federation and two from those two bigger uh, federations, so Montreal and Quebec, and also one member from the non-federated uh, members. And they are all elected for uh, a one-year mandate that is renew renewable. 
in terms of funding, so that's also interesting compared to Brian's presentation because um, because there's kind of two levels. You have the network and then those federation coming in. Um, the, the structure is, is slightly different and uh, the network tend to engage maybe less in some areas uh, there. Um, so, a, a, you know, the big portion of their uh, funding comes directly from uh, provincial government through different program, but mainly through core funding uh, support. So uh, to core mission funding. Um, and the second big piece, you know, coming second in importance, the insurance program my, managed by the network. Um, that's a huge source of income. Uh, I'll talk about it a bit uh, later on. Um, it is not a, a revenue that can be, uh, it, it cannot necessarily support other activities. I'll, I'll talk about it uh, a, a bit uh, later on. But other than that, uh, you see that same goes for uh, what Brian was saying for BC and PHA. Um, you know, membership fees uh, is only for you know about five percent, and you have those uh, parent initiative uh, that also you know takes a five percent, and then sponsorship events is is more um, you know uh, less important here, in in the case of the network. So the RQAs is a key actor uh, in research and advocacy. Uh, same goes, you know, as BC and PHA on that end for sure. Um, it is, you know, it's it participates in many provincial research research initiative. Um, so we benefit from a, a large variety of groups uh, in in Quebec. Uh, some specify, you know, specialize in into advocacy um, of you know toward homelessness or affordability uh, of housing. Um, so they, they will not necessarily lead the march, but will always be part of it at some uh, extent. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, uh, when, when they have to uh, submit taking participation in many legislative, le legislative committees and consultation, you know, sending m memorandum um, and, um, you know, t organizing uh, activities and uh, you know toward lobbying and, and advocacy uh, so one thing that they do uh, almost uh, each time an election comes in is to uh, make available those uh, informative sheets for each uh, electoral district uh, so local groups and federation can can uh, use them to uh, reach out to local MPs and um, you know do their their part of advocacy. Another uh, a, a recurring event is the Blitz. So that's one day of um, meetings with uh, members of uh, legislative house. Um, and uh, you know so we we go at Quebec City and and try to do that that Blitz of uh, lobbying for the sector. Um, so in terms of activities, of course, there's those webinar, that annual conference, um, professional training session related to housing. So in many, many uh, subjects, uh, I think um, uh, Brian mentioned harassment. In the past year, we've seen uh, the subject of uh, senior residences uh really being a hot topic there there was new re uh, regulation uh obviously you know the past year have been really uh something so uh making sure groups have all the necessary information the latest um you know bylaws and and uh, of course sanitary uh, restriction put in place and you know making sure all groups know and are aware of, of those and then we, in terms of programs, so that's a huge part of what the net, the yeah, the network can do uh, for um, groups and federations. So same goes here. Um, you know, reaching out to those providers of services. Um, so you see Johnson Controls. You know, that's uh, alarm system. You have construction companies. 
uh, energy efficiency there, um, hydro solution that's for uh, yeah, you know water heater. So getting discounts, um, you know, uh, uh, pooling to get better uh, pricing at the end. The mutualization for health and safety prevention. So I'm not uh, necessarily aware in Nova Scotia how it works, but uh, you know, for any workers, there's some uh, dues for you know co to cover um, any health and safety related uh, you know accident that can happen. Uh, so as a small provider, you would need in Quebec to pay those dues directly to the, the government, to the uh, provincial structure, or else if you're a bigger organization, you can um, um, invest in, um, in your own uh, program. So that's what the network did, you know, pooling everyone together and reaching out to a private materialization for, uh, you know, health and safety and, and you know, lowering um, the fees but increasing services and training uh, for workers. Um, I think Brian mentioned the Van City partnership. So we, there's a similar partnership with our credit union, Desjardins. Uh, so, you know, better banking services at lower and no, or no fees, uh, reimbursement of professional fees. So for notary, for example, and better rates on investments. So though, for group that makes a huge difference. Coming to the, the big piece here, the insurance program called Sequoia. Uh, so that was, you know, an idea taking from other groups. Uh, I think in Ontario also they have uh, they have that. Um, so what does that do? Well, it ensures that every member uh, get um, insurance coverage uh, because sometimes, you know, especially if you have um, uh, a clientele with special needs, uh, insurer might get uncomfortable. So having the association stepping in and ensuring that everyone can get covered means you know the world uh for those groups um so pooling together to uh minimize risk uh and and minimize also um the ikes that can you can see from year to year and i'm sure you know you've been affected the same way that quebec has been uh, on that end, you know, uh, suffering from huge hikes and, and sometimes um, even with the program, uh, having difficulties on some extent to get covered, at least they're back, you know, they're not alone in, in that, uh, that fight that need to be carried sometimes. Also, because the, the network uh, does the administration of the program, uh, it takes a small percentage. You've seen it in the um, in the revenue uh, display. Well, that revenue is not dedicated toward other stuff. It it stays in that program and cover you know many fees that would be uh, otherwise covered by those local groups. So free evaluation of reconstruction value, that's something that will, you know, the insurance company will ask you sometimes. So that is covered by the program itself. So there's also a committee advising on preventive measure to lower risk. So always managing the, the you know, level of risk uh, so we don't suffer from hikes. And, um, Yes, uh, especially this year, because there was a lot of issues uh, with, with groups not being able sometimes to renew or having difficulties, uh, should I say. Uh, they engage into, uh, they, they've hired a consultant to do a full evaluation um, of you know their pool, seeing if the, the increase was legit or not. Uh, so that's a huge uh, benefit from, from that insurance program. And now on the federation side, so what, what activities does th those regional federation do? Uh, so member engagement, that's really 
more at the fed, uh, federation level that you will see round you know regional roundtable dialogue consultation those AGM that really you know are the forum for you know democratic forum for local members. Um, of course, there's AGM at the network level, uh, but sometimes uh, you know it, it's not necessarily the same crowd that will attend those, those meetings. And having a, a more regional uh, meeting will certainly help um, some groups to to be more active, to participate a bit more uh, on that end. Uh, so manage the, on, on the management side compared to BC and PHA, um, that is more at the fed, you know, federation level again, uh, giving support, counseling, and, and sometimes engaging into uh, management services. So if a group doesn't feel uh, strong enough, can you know go to the federation to get that. <coughs> Sorry, on all those services, of course, it's not necessarily equal throughout the, the, the province. So some federation are stronger, get more members. Um, some are smaller, but that doesn't mean that uh, they're less engaged. So you see sometimes a smaller federation with a huge level of uh, participation in those AGM and they will, you know, uh, do a lot of action for advocacy and, and outreach to uh, MPs and all of that. On those dis distinction, there is two uh, service centers, so one in Montreal, one in Quebec, those, those bigger uh, federation. Um, at those uh, service centers, you can get you know, asset management services, building condition assessment. Um, and uh, uh, one thing that explained that is some programs, provincial programs that are in place to uh, build new housing, um, they will um, ask you to go and use those services to, to those service center. Uh, so that you, creates you know, a demand, a, cons, you know, a, uh, a continuity um, to maintain those services. So you know, there, there's a dynamic there. Uh, I'll be able to, to answer your question if you have uh, any uh, regarding this, but you know, you, you get the picture. It's it's there's a, a variety of federation. Uh, some are better at doing some things. So obviously, there's there's some dynamics uh, going uh, going on over there, and uh, local advocacy, like I said. So. Uh, local development groups sitting with the you know the city, uh, those private you know developers trying to make something good for the community housing sector. And maybe just uh, last thing, uh, covering you know structuring initiative that were put in place by the network or or still in development. So one of them is the COLOC, uh, Corporation du Logement Communautaire du Québec. So uh, it's an affiliated organization that was put in place. Um, it's managed by the network and it got, and that, that was the initiative I was uh, carrying. Um, and in one year, we went from, you know, nothing to 150 units that we were able to, you know, rescue or restructure at some point, uh, at some end, um, and, and avoid them to close or sell to the private sector. So that was a huge, thing and and you see now um new um similar organization being put in place by federation also uh so to, to be sometimes more nimble or answer to specific gaps uh, so that's the sort of things we we can see uh, happening at the moment in quebec and the fric uh which you know uh, it's a slang, slang word for money uh but it's an acronym also basically um it's a mutualization of renovation uh, reserve um of you know each group so the idea is to pull them uh to get a you know better uh rates when you invest those so instead of having your small reserve uh of a couple of thousand dollars in your bank account trying to pull that uh, all together and go see you know 
in, uh, financial institution to get better rates at the end. So that's the idea. It's not yet uh, in place, but the, of course, it's always a long process for development of, of those initiatives. Um, but that gives you uh, an idea of what innovation is, is being carried at the moment. So I'll be um, open for your question and thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. Merci, Luc. That's great information. Um, our third panelists, we have two, George Cormier and Kit Hickey for New Brunswick. Uh, George is the executive director of the New Brunswick Nonprofit Housing Association. He has many, many years of experience and currently is supporting approximately 200 housing groups in New Brunswick. Kit is the past president of the New Brunswick Nonprofit Association, the executive director of the Housing Alternatives Incorporated in St. John, and is also um, on the Community Housing Transformation Center's Board of Directors. Uh, thank you very much and uh, take it away. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Can everybody see that? Uh, yes, can you see it? it's, yes, yeah. I can see it. Yep, yeah. thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so here we go, this first slide. So um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the history of the NB Nonprofit Housing Association. So essentially, the association was initially created in 1993. Um, so we're uh, officially 28 years old, I guess, this year. Um, initially, the association was really created to supplement the work that was being done by the department, which is now social development. At, at the time, it was NB housing. Uh, it was to do with member support, education, and advocacy. Um, we're a registered nonprofit, but we don't have charity status. So initially when the association started, the funding received from government was really intended to employ one person to do an annual conference, which uh, would be attended by every member of the association and social development staff. I can tell you that 27 years after, uh, this is the 28th year, other than the last two years um, because of COVID, um, that conference has been held every year and we feel it's a world-class conference um, and it's well attended and lots of networking going on there. So the board of directors uh, for the association, um, we've got four members that would be considered at large. So we've got <clears throat> the past president, so which is Kit right now, uh, that's uh, uh, on, on this session with me. There's the president that's a two-year term, renewable once, the VP is the same thing, and secretary treasurer is the same thing. So essentially they can be on for four years. Um, and then we they form what we call the executive, and the executive is often called upon to form ad hoc committees, attend various meetings on behalf of the association. For instance, when we advocate um, with the province, often the executive will be uh, the, the people that will accompany myself uh, to meet with the minister or senior staff of the Department of Social Development. The remainder of the board is composed of regional directors and in New Brunswick, there's seven administrative regions. So there would be one per region. So the vision, which is from our 2017 um, strategic planning exercise is to promote and facilitate safe, affordable and permanent housing and the mission uh, is um, working together to empower our members through education, capacity building, advocacy, and strategic partnerships. So um, when uh, BC was presented, uh, I saw some, uh, 
similarities between the vision and mission in BC and the one in New Brunswick. The way we are funded, uh, essentially, um, uh, we don't have the scale that Quebec and BC has, uh, obviously, in New Brunswick. So membership dues, we get a grant from the province of New Brunswick, and annual conference revenue represent about one third each of the association's income. And our annual operating budget is about $350,000 a year. So um, <clears throat> pales in comparison to uh, BC and, and Quebec, but of course uh, it, it's based on the number, population, et cetera. Uh, in 2019, these sources of funding became a little bit less stable. So the association began to explore other methods of revenue generation, including project management service, which I'll talk about a bit more later on. So our membership, we've got about 175, over 175 nonprofit and co-op housing corporations. Um, they are located in 115 different communities in New Brunswick. So if you think about seven regions, Moncton is the three big municipalities in New Brunswick are each in a region. So Moncton would be in a region, so would St. John and Fredericton. Um, so the large majority of units would come from St. John and Moncton, Fredericton being maybe an exception in that regard. But that means there's many small projects in different rural communities in the province and the other uh, bigger centers like Bathurst and Edmonston. So the members own and manage over 6,000 units of affordable housing in the province. And these are provided for seniors, families and individuals of low income. So what do we do it's in terms of member services? So um, again, I said earlier, we have a, a, a service that's in support of member project administration and development activities. Uh, initially, it started more like a project management service. It has sort of evolved to be a proposal management service. The difference being that we don't typically get involved in the project management per se, in terms of on-site. So we will develop proposals, whether those be proposals to Community Housing Transformation Center or FCM or CMHC, we will develop financing proposals, um, but it's, it's more in line with that. And of course, we, we charge money for doing that. Um, but we don't charge as much as they would pay on the market. So sort of a deal for them and it's a revenue maker for us. Uh, we also deliver an annual conference. Like I said, we do have an insurance program um, that is of benefit to members and it is a partnership type program. So we do get uh, some revenues from that program. It, it's sort of, peaks and valleys because it's based on the amount of claims that would be made in any given year. So in some years we can get a bit of a windfall and in other years we don't get a lot of money. So it, it's not really a stable source of revenue. And we have education and training programs as well, banking services. And we also have our website that has quite a bit of housing information on it. We've also introduced a few years ago, and it's been quite popular and quite useful for our members, is an expired agreement assessment tool. And what that tool does is it predicts cash flow and replacement reserve adequacy after the expiry of operating agreements. So people, our members typically will get their projects assessed two or three years prior to expiry so they can start planning uh, in case. Um, Post expiry will mean difficulty in either replacement reserve or cash flow. In terms of advocacy, um, 
We advocate, of course, for affordable housing, and we work with all levels of government and other partners, whether that be provincially or nationally. Um, we advocate to make sure that there's an adequate supply of affordable housing, and we do um, have, well, CHRA, we have, uh, I'm on the board of CHRA myself, so I'm the New Brunswick rep on CHRA, but we have relationships with them and, and Cooperative Housing Federation, CMHC, FCM, CHTC, and Social Development, which is the provincial um, uh, government. We have quarterly meetings with the Department of Social Development, the housing department, and we do provide advocacy kits for members before federal, provincial, and municipal elections, and a lot of them use them. Um, so that's been something that we do as well. Uh, some of the recent successes and projects that we've that we've had since we've introduced the proposal management service is um, we were the one of the first retrofit capital projects under the FCM Sustainable Affordable Housing Program. We were the first out of the gate for New Brunswick with two projects uh, from the Community Housing Transformation Center. And uh, we did author the only New Brunswick proposal that was retained in the first round of the Rapid Housing Initiative. So we have had some successes for our members um, uh, with our project or proposal management service. Our current initiatives, which are really important. So the Community Housing Transformation Center gave us some funding to develop a member information system. Uh, this is gonna be useful in many respects. Um, so it's going to capture all projects uh, and entities uh, around the province and it has a financial module. So for the association, it's going to allow us to do some planning uh, programs. Uh, it was interesting to see that um, both Quebec and BC are doing bulk buying. We have been talking about doing that. When we get the information in the system loaded up, we will be able to plan that uh, more uh, efficiently and effectively. What our members are going to get from it is that they're going to be able to compare. They won't be able to see other members financial information, but they'll be able to compare themselves with their peers uh, regionally or provincially by, by cost item or budget line, if you want, budget expenditure line, as well as in aggregate. So it's gonna be a useful information for our members and it's gonna be useful for us. As well, there is going there is a, a GIS app in the system. So there's gonna be a color code for every project. So at a glance, we're gonna be able to see which projects um, may be experiencing difficulty uh, through the color code and be able to maybe intervene and help them out like Quebec is doing with rescue projects. So uh, we're looking forward to that. We're uh, we're not at the stage where we are ready to roll it out to members yet, but we're almost there. We're just finalizing all of the uh, project information into the system right now. The other project that we've got that's, um, uh, that we're going out to members now to, to see which ones wanna participate is a sector energy audit project. So essentially, um, the idea is to do an entire footprint energy audit of every project in the province that has not already been done and get the information there and put it in the member information system so that when projects, when uh, community housing providers are going to be planning renovations, They'll, we will know if they qualify, for instance, for FCM's uh, Sustainable Affordable Housing Program, uh, which is 30% of energy reduction in order to qualify. So it will be useful information for accessing maybe additional funding and doing 
uh, more green projects in the province. Uh, we're also uh, feel good about participating in the first affordable housing net zero ready build, uh, which is part of the RHI project that was approved. So um, uh, that's being built right now. So um, it's uh, it's the first uh, affordable housing net zero ready build in New Brunswick. Um, and we're working on a new strategic plan right now. And we've also, as an association, put a bid in <clears throat> under an RFP for uh, Miramichi, which is um, a city in the middle of New Brunswick that is looking for work to get done on a housing authority for, for it's a three year project. So we're one of two finalists for that for that RFP. And uh, thank you. Uh, Kit is here with me. I refer to her as the matriarch of nonprofit housing in New Brunswick. She's been around forever. She knows everything. She's here as a resource. She will be addressing questions and she may want to add a little bit to what I said. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it open if she wants to do that. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks for that, uh, uh, George. Yes, I have been around forever, but uh, however. Um, yeah, so I would just like to uh, add, when we were looking at uh, developing the uh, programs, we looked to our uh, national partners um, for some of the uh, uh, programs that we would be able to uh, adapt for New Brunswick. So for example, with the insurance program, we looked to the uh, Cooperative Housing Federation of Canada with their uh, national insurance program for housing cooperatives. And uh, the uh, provincial one for nonprofits was uh, modeled after that. Additionally, we looked at uh, CHF Canada's uh, banking program, the uh, CHIP program, uh, Cooperative Housing Investment Program, uh, same uh, Van City, it would be uh, very similar uh, to that. And um, uh, so we didn't try to uh, uh, create uh, everything new because we knew that there were some very successful uh, uh, programs that were running out there. And uh, so that's uh, what we looked to. We also uh, were able to uh, develop a uh, property tax uh, uh, program for the uh, nonprofit and cooperative housing projects in the uh, province as well. Um, I know our uh, setup with property taxes is uh, different um, than a lot of the other provinces across the uh, country in that uh, they are uh, the uh, taxes are administered and collected by the uh, provincial government. However, what we were able to uh, do was um, uh, develop a, a program that uh, saves the uh, nonprofit housing organizations approximately 50% in, uh, in property taxes. And uh, as well, we were also able uh, to um, uh, uh, be included in uh, the provincial uh, buying program for appliances. And uh, so we are able to uh, purchase appliances uh, direct from the manufacturer at the uh, same price that the provincial government does. Uh, so, you know, we uh, do have a number of programs in place. And as I said, uh, we uh, look to the uh, most successful programs across the uh, country and uh, we're very fortunate to be able to uh, model hours after some of them. Thank you very much, George and Kit. Great information. Um, and I don't know if my, uh, Pauline, will you be back on? Thank you very much to Brian, Luke, George, Kit for this great information. Um, I believe the next step is, is there yep. any words, final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the group? Renee, maybe we'll take a few questions from the crowd first. Okay. And then we'll and then we'll offer each of the panelists an opportunity to, to give us a closing, a closing reflection or a bit of advice as we consider how do we go forward in the province of New Brun of, of Nova Scotia. And uh, yeah, like like Renee, I'd certainly like to reiterate my thanks for all that you've shared. You've been very concise, very, very straightforward, and you've all stayed to the time. So that's absolutely fantastic. There are a couple of questions posted in the chat. The first one is for you, George, and it's from uh, Nancy O'Regan. And Nancy is wondering, does the member information system use a specific platform or program that you would recommend? 
So, well, the answer is no. Um, so we hired a programmer, a programming firm. So it is a program that was essentially done from scratch. Um, it's going to be web-based. Um, you can download apps. You can download apps on iPhone or on, on Android. Um, so you can access the information pretty much from anywhere. Um, so no, it's, we, we went that route. We could, maybe could have gone a different route, but we went that route. And maybe we had a, a little bit of a, a reason for doing that. And that is that we are going to offer it to other jurisdictions that might want to use it. And so um, it, it might make us a little bit of money, not a lot, but in, in terms of support and stuff like that. So um, it's always but good it to is. be entrepreneurial. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, George, we'll we'll stay tuned to hear when that when that product is is launched. That could be something that could save a lot of other um, organizations a lot of uh, research and development time. So, yeah, thanks for sharing that. We also have a question. Someone is asking, where is the Rapid Housing Initiative project located in New Brunswick? It's in Moncton. Mm -hmm. It's um, a new organization called Rising Tide Community Initiatives. Mm -hmm. And they received um, money from the provincial and municipal government, which is not so usual in New Brunswick, to create 125 uh, units for homeless individuals in the city of Moncton. And so the Rapid Housing Initiative project actually incremented that number to 162 rather than 125. So that's, wow, that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. So I'd like to encourage people to type their type their questions into chat while we we have about uh, 27, 28 minutes left. So there's lots of time to to pose some questions to our panelists and get their specific feedback on on certain elements uh, that we're wondering about. I see there are a couple of coming now. One is, are you able to see the other questions or should I copy them to you? So that was Jenny to me. <laughs> and I can, I, I can see what's in the chat, Jenny. I'll just let you know that. There, there was a question about uh, BC and BHA membership fees, um, which I'm okay. going to just put in the chat uh, a link, which actually provides a bit of a breakdown there. Um, so basically the, the kind of membership, it's structured uh, based on voting members, which are nonprofit housing societies. And uh, there are basically associate members, which are non-voting members. Um, basically, how it works is uh, the, the allocation of what you pay in a membership due is based on how many units you operate as a society. Um, so basically, within the context of BC, um, you, know, you have a lot of kind of smaller providers, about 50% of the stock operate one or two buildings. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have... Um, you know, a smaller number of large societies. Um, so that, that's kind of how that is structured. It's to kind of reflect the, the realities of um, the, the nonprofit sector within BC. And then, you know, the associate members, um, you could probably see there on that link that I provided, but, uh, you know, we, we also provide the, they also provide the membership. I keep on saying we, <laughs> as if I still work there, but um, <laughs> um, but no, there's uh, nonprofits who are developing housing, um, and then you kind of have commercial and government partners as well. And so there's a different uh, membership structure there as well. Um, so just refer to that link and scroll down a little bit and uh, you'll have the breakdown of what that looks like. Okay, that's great. Thanks so much, Brian. And Brian, there's another question for you in chat uh, from Kevin. Thanks for the great presentation. I feel like many of the revenue streams you spoke of relied on the association being an established entity. Uh, i.e. probably were not available in the association's first years. Do you know where the operating funds came from as the association was getting off the ground? Yeah, so it, it is a great question. Um, so just, just as a little bit of historical context here, uh, BCMPJ was uh, developed in 1993. And so I wasn't at the association at the time when it was kind of happening. But my understanding of that is uh, we had one of my colleagues, Alice Sumberg, she basically got in her van and drove around the province and started signing up members to this fledgling organization. 
Um, and this was kind of happening in the context of government retrenchment of um, our national housing program uh, back in 1993. So my, I'm gonna speculate here that initially the uh, organization was um, high, more highly reliant on membership dues. Um, and then kind of as time progressed and you know you kind of build partnerships and things grew, um, you were able to, yes, build out those kinds of programs and things like that. What I, what I do also wanna to say to that as well is that when I joined the association in 2014, we were a staff of eight people, eight to 10 people, something like that. And by the time I left in, uh, you know, just earlier this summer, um, we were at, uh, I think over 30 staff. So in a period of seven years, we grew, um, you know, significantly, we, you know, more than doubled. And, um, you know, I think that it just speaks to that if you have the, the kind of drill, a drive and the uh, entrepreneurialism, there is the opportunity to, to grow really fast. That's great, Brian. Yeah. Uh, Brian, someone is also asking, uh, they're wondering, and this refers back to your presentation, um, how, many, how many homes, how many units of housing have been built so far? So the nonprofit housing sector um, in BC, to our best estimates, um, currently is about 65,000 units. And that spans the range of, um, you know, kind of more independent housing, mm -hmm. uh, as well as kind of uh, supportive housing and, and some transitional housing. There's another 14,000 units or beds of uh, shelter and emergency forms of housing in the province. So that's, that was kind of as of our uh, census of about 2012. Um, of the nonprofit housing sector. The commitments by uh, the provincial government in the 2018 budget were to support the construction of another um, 114,000 units of affordable housing. Wow. And that's also, um, you know, not including the kind of federal commitments uh, under the, the national housing strategy. So um, we, we don't have the best sense of that number. I, I don't actually have it off the top of my head, but um, what we know from the provincial programs is they had initiated, I think, about uh, 23,000 units um, as of this summer. So, uh, that, you know, that's not everything being built, but, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's in progress of being built. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah. Great. There's, there's another question here from Kevin Hooper that I just noticed. Are any of your organizations able to quantify the benefits that member organizations receive? I would say uh, it, it depends also uh, on much they, they want to benefit from those services. So some, some people will only want to know that there's a, an entity uh, doing advocacy efforts on their behalf and that, that is enough for them. Some will want to get those training opportunities that sometimes are offered for free. Um, I know for our, our QOH on those um, training uh, opportunities, sometimes it's, you know, uh, establish uh, training session. So those might cost something for the user. Um, if it's given by the network, maybe the federation will uh, cover some fees for the his you know the, its members. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to answer that question. Maybe uh, Georges would have a better better idea there. <laughs> I'm throwing you the the ball. <laughs> Thanks, Luke. Would George Kit or Kit would you like to respond to that? Um, well, I'll jump in uh, uh, first. In regards to the insurance program, we've never actually uh, quantified the, and I think that it would be very difficult to uh, quantify the actual savings, uh, but we know that uh, the uh, savings that are realized uh, because uh, uh, we have uh, had other insurance uh, companies look at it to see if they could compete um, have been uh, significant. So we do know they are significant, but just given the uh, housing stock across the uh, province, the uh, size of the organizations, they range from uh, two units up to, uh, you know, uh, 300. Uh, so it's very difficult to uh, quantify that other than we do know that it's uh, significant. It's uh, uh, savings far greater than what anybody would pay in their annual membership uh, fees. And uh, then uh, additionally, uh, with the appliance program, 
Again, not uh, not quite sure what the actual savings are. Uh, uh, probably somewhere in the range of uh, twenty five to thirty percent on the uh, on the appliances. And then we know with the uh, property tax program, it's approximately uh, fifty percent of the uh, tax bill on an annual basis. Wow, interesting, interesting. Uh, George or Brian, would either of you add to that? Well, other than what Kit said, I think. Uh, um, I think it's right. I think that just the insurance program more than pays for the membership fees for our members. So we've had some that weren't on the program um, uh, recently. Um, and when we told them about it and they went, they, 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 were, they were really surprised by the amount that they, they were saving. Um, the other thing that I, I think, <clears throat> one of the reasons that we're doing the, the man, uh, member information system is, is to get some real good data, financial data on some of these cost items and where we can where we can introduce programs. One of the things that we've spoken about, of course, all of pretty much all of our members have to uh, produce audited financial statements every year. Um, and we did a little survey and the price of that is all over the map. Uh, to be honest with you, um, for for very few units, some people are are paying as astronomical amounts to get an annual audit done. So when we have that data loaded, we're going to be able to to really focus and zone in in certain expense categories. Where, for instance, as simple as garbage removal, right? Everybody's getting it done almost. They're all, some are doing it local. If you have a provincial tender, what's the cost going to be then, right? So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different areas, I think, that we're going to be able to, to help with. Getting that information is the first step. Then then looking at the areas where we feel we can get some, some real bang for the buck is, is the next step, right? So. Great. Thanks, George. Brian, would you add anything or, or shall we go on? I mean, I think it's a, a kind of similar story in BC and, um, you know, <laughs> assessing the, the member benefits um, can be a difficult game. I'm not sure if I have anything kind of quantitative that speaks to that. I mean, a lot of um, qualitative aspects of that. And, you know, BC and BHA does offer a range of um, insurance programs as well that I think, you know, are, are huge benefits and do kind of pay for themselves as well. Great. Thanks, Brian. Maybe one, one last comment. But, yes. Um, yes, yeah, sure, Luke. You know, wh how big is a, the benefit of having all the sector to, you know, create a, a coalition and pressurize the, the, you know, authorities to invest more into social housing? You know, that, you know, it's uncountable. You know, it's, <laughs> we're talking about millions of dollars, you know, through, throughout, you know, each year. So, yeah. yeah. The value of the strength in numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Which is difficult it's, to quantify, but certainly a lot of, you know, I think benefit from, um, you know, working together for sure. Great. Thank you both. So the next question is from Pat Kipping and Pat is asking, where is Nova Scotia in developing a similar organization or is the Nova Scotia Affordable ha Housing Association? And what is the relationship to the Transformation Center? So I think that I could safely say that currently in Nova Scotia, we do not have a community housing sector organization. And part of the reason why the Build Together project is happening is that there was certainly a, a bit of a call from the ground uh, to look at how could we possibly form some sort of provincial entity that would serve the sector better. And therefore the St. FX Extension Department, where, where I work, we have partnered with, uh, with Renee and the folks at the Community Housing Transformation Center uh, to, to implement the Build Together project to look at how, in fact, the community housing sector could be strengthened. And this, this panel presentation this evening is, is the third time that we've uh, engaged people who are working and supporting the community housing sector in the province to find out exactly how they would like to work together going forward. So at, at this point, uh, we're asking questions about form and function, and we're here this evening to learn from our panelists about how these provincial organizations are working in three other provinces. Um, 
and I think uh, based on what we hear this evening and through a survey that's currently active and live in the province, as well as a couple of online uh, engagement sessions that people can participate in, um, we, will, we will gather our people. We have a, an engagement team across the province that is 30 people strong, and we will actually start putting pen to paper and figuring out what the roadmap could look like for how the community housing sector works together going forward. Uh, Renee, would you add anything to that from the center's perspective? No, I, I don't think I have anything to add. Uh, it, it, it came from Nova Scotia, wanting something made in Nova Scotia. Uh, and the engagement process has been going on now since last, I wanna say February, I think it was when it first started. So yeah, I don't think I have anything pertinent to add. Okay, thanks, Renee. We've got a question from Ramsey Cower, who's asking how familiar the speakers are uh, with the situation in Nova Scotia and what is one piece of advice you would give. And Ramsey, I'm wondering if, if it's okay if we hold that question and maybe that will be our final, our closing question to each of our panelists this evening. So I, I think if you don't mind, that's how, that's how we'll, we'll go with that one. Uh, Wayne uh, has asked a question about the number of units built in British Columbia, and I think Brian has already addressed that question. Um, Mel Sturk, who is a member of our, our provincial engagement team, is asking, so for any of the panelists, with considerable operational funding coming from provincial governments, do you feel you have a good level of autonomy, and do you face challenges in lobbying and advocacy efforts? Are there any lessons to share? So I think that we should start with Kit this time. Kit, do you, would you like to respond to Mel's question? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, uh, so um, are there challenges? Absolutely. New Brunswick Nonprofit Housing Association and the uh, provincial uh, government, the department now known as the Department of uh, Social Development, uh, developed a uh, partnership oh, many years ago. It was probably 1994, 95, somewhere in that vicinity. And uh, we have been uh, working in partnership um, uh, since that time. We meet on a uh, on a regular uh, basis, uh, typically uh, quarterly, uh, with uh, senior staff, and uh, at least annually uh, with the uh, minister, if not if not more uh, frequently. And uh, so we have been fortunate in over the uh, years that uh, we have had a fairly good relationship. There have been bumps along the uh, way. There's no question of that. Um, uh, but um, uh, now we're uh, it's a matter of uh, building that um, a relationship of uh, trust and uh, understanding that our goal is common. We're working towards exactly the uh, same thing. And uh, so we are, um, uh, uh, we are uh, sharing information on a, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, the um, uh, really the amount of uh, money that we receive from the uh, provincial government by way of grant is um, has always been a contribution towards the annual uh, conference and uh, and a bit uh, towards uh, operations. Uh, it doesn't even begin to uh, cover the uh, entire budget. That's uh, there's no question of uh, of that. And uh, we feel that our contribution uh, towards the uh, the government's uh, response responsibility is um, far greater than what we receive in the, in the annual uh, uh, contribution. However, it's something that uh, we continue to uh, work on. And, um, uh, you know, it's uh, a matter of uh, uh, developing that relationship and, uh, and uh, building the uh, trust and ensuring that they do appreciate and understand the value that the association brings. Wow, that's a, that's a great and thorough answer, Kit. Thank you for that. Um, Brian, Luke, or George, is there anything that you would add in addition to what to what Kit has offered? Um, I mean, what I would say to that, uh, I, I think from BCBJ's perspective, is that they've been very intentional in you know trying to to build a funding picture that's um, not reliant on on government funding, but uh, is not solely kind of dependent on it. And I think that that's. Uh, you know, for this very reason that they want to be kind of independent and be able to be critics of government um, when the time comes. There has been various instances of that kind of happening. And then I think also just from a financial sustainability piece as well, too. I mean, um, 
as governments can, you know, provide the funding, they can as easily take it away. So that that's really been kind of a focus of the association is to really have that independence. Great. Thank you, Brian. Uh, George or Luke? Um, it's it's a hard uh, once it's 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 uh, established. It's hard for governments to withdraw what they they gave to the sector. And we are creating wealth. We are creating benefit to the entire you know community. And um, sometimes we just need to um, make the government understand that and how much we are helping our, our community. And the benefits is way greater than what they can commit uh, in, in terms of funding. And, and in fact, uh, for FQOH, it's, if we're looking at their situation, it, it's been almost the opposite. So even though uh, our current government haven't uh, injected that much more into our building programs that we have, um, uh the the core mission funding have increased and not because of you know pure magic it has been uh coalition uh coalized effort toward that uh through many years and we recently you know i think it was uh, last year uh i think it's almost it has doubled and uh, th there's no uh, shame in, in, in or, or complex uh, for those organizations that benefits from that. It only you know empower them to do more, and uh, obviously advocacy won't stop. Okay, good. Thank you, Luke. We have a, a statement or a question from from Carol uh, saying social housing defined in Europe rent to own options. So I. I think Carol is, is, is trying to uh, go a little deeper here in terms of what social housing could look like. Would, would any of you like to speak to that briefly? And then we'll move on to the question about uh, what's the biggest challenge in building and or operating a provincial housing association. So would, um, anyone, would anyone like to field the social housing definition uh, as it's defined in Europe question? Um, I, I think it depends on where you are in Europe, um, but but certainly, um, you know, when you look at kind of regions like or jurisdictions like the Netherlands and France, um, they're more active in promoting nonprofit housing for middle income groups, and um, there's a lot less stigmatization of um, you know you know just middle class folks kind of uh, living in that kind of thing. In the UK, they they have actually had uh, rent to own options. That's been a uh, uh, kind of policy of the last 40 years. Um, a lot of their social housing stock um, kind of went through a rent to buy um, uh, process there. Um, so yeah, that's that's what I would just say as a couple of comments there. Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. And Jenny has very kindly uh, put into chat the link to the Build Together project and specifically the link to how people can participate in, in consultation C. Uh, by watching a video, perhaps looking at a few documents and completing a survey where we're asking people, how do they see the community housing sector members working together in Nova Scotia? So if you haven't already been part of the project, please feel free to go and visit our website and sign up to get on our mailing list. We'd love to have more people join us after this event. It's 7.52. We've got one really good question here about what is the biggest challenge in building and or operating a provincial housing association. Maybe we could we could do a quick round on this one and perhaps squeeze in one more question before we conclude. Um, let's go to let, let's go to Luke this time. What's the biggest challenge in building and or operating a provincial housing association? Yeah, well, I wasn't there for the building part. I was quite <laughs> young, uh, but uh, the network itself uh, has uh, about 20 years of existence. It came after Federation. So that maybe is a, a key info that I haven't mentioned in my presentation. So it, it, it was kind of organic growth, mm -hmm. uh, you know, group pro housing providers uh, came together to create their own association locally. And at some point, you know, uh, association from Montreal, then the one you know in, in Lac Saint Jean, they they came together to create the network. Then it has um, you know made a, 
a need to create other federation where there there was uh, none, uh, and still at this day there there was one to, you know administrative region where they, they there was none still. Um, but this dynamic that is you know not unique, but uh, uh, the, the, this structure is is different from you know the other presentation we had tonight. Um, I think there, there would be similar dynamics of regional concerns or inequality, and, and that in any <laughs> structure will always be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about Nova Scotia, but I had the chance to uh, visit uh, may, maybe some, some people I, I met are, are uh, tonight with us. Uh, we went in Halifax and then we drove to uh, Sydney, and um, it was, you know, obviously really interesting to meet people and see um, the province and the differences. And obviously there's a large area, uh, like in many of our province in Canada, of rural areas. Uh, so obviously I'm sure there's dynamics of, you know, Halifax uh, having more resources, more uh, services uh, than other region. So those dynamic will still remain after you decide whether you know you want to create that provincial association or not and i you know i i have no really <laughs> any uh, uh, advice on that but you know other than than being patient and and trying to put the the basis for a structure that will allow everyone to have his voice uh is it to create you know regional federation I can tell you just from you know the, the the few years I've been there, there's some dynamics that restrain sometimes initiative from the network to you know develop services or you know training that would benefit to everyone, uh, and you know because you know one federation prefers to keep that privilege to itself. That's fair, you know. They, they have the, the total right in, the, in that structure, but uh, I would advise you to to keep that in mind, uh, trying to be as equal and balanced as possible from the beginning. Right. So it sounds like we're we're getting answers to both questions here, Luke. You're talking about the importance of being patient, about knowing the local dynamics, about making sure that uh, that everyone's voice has an opportunity to be heard, and to really focus on working together and building equity into, into the formation of whatever provincial organization may, may evolve under this process. Did I capture that okay? Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, George, maybe we can, we, can, we can turn the question a little bit and say, you know, what advice would you give based on your experience with encountering challenges in the past? Well, I'm not gonna talk that much about <clears throat> Challenges, there's always challenges. Mm -hmm. I think it's overdue. I think Nova Scotia needs to organize into an umbrella organization. There's so many benefits to having a provincial organization. Yes, you're gonna have challenges. You're gonna have people that say there's inequities. We're going through a strategic plan right now. And one of the things that came up is that our rural areas feel that you know, they want us to engage more. Well, we're going to do it. We're going to engage more. We're going to do more stuff with regions. I mean, so, but they benefit from all the advocacy that we do. They benefit from every program that we put forward. They benefit from all that. And we're also going to tweak how, how we deal with certain things so that they will be included as well. So, the thing is, I think when I when I listen to BC and Quebec, they're bigger, right? So scale is important sometimes. So any individual organization in Nova Scotia is not going to be able to do as much as everybody together. And nobody can argue against that, right? Nobody can argue against that. So there is strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. And Right there, there's a reason for doing it. And we can talk about, we've already talked to our insurance provider. He says, if Nova Scotia organizes, 
I want to talk to them. I want to give them the same program that you have, right? So, I mean, so that there's already people that would knock on your door if you organize in Nova Scotia to do to do business with you, and that's going to benefit your members. So, um, I think you know, to me, uh, as as well, I'd like to talk if, if Nova Scotia organizes. I think there's probably certain things that we should cooperate on just to get that much more scale, right? Absolutely. So, when you're talking about asset management, when you're talking about bulk purchasing, when you're talking about other different things that, that can be done. Like we've we've got things, we've got things that we've developed for our members. Like we didn't even talk about it tonight, like like governance, right? And governance documents, proper governance documents and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it, you don't think about that, but sometimes if you've got something that's already there for you, made for a nonprofit housing provider, then, you know, just grab it, right? Don't recreate the wheel. I think Kit said enough about that. The programs yeah. that were created in New Brunswick yeah. were based on this wheel was already created. We're not going to create it again. We're just going to tweak it and make it a little bit New Brunswick-like, New Brunswick -like, right? So, I mean, just do it. Do it. You need to do this. <laughs> George, you've got a whole bunch of lessons and pieces of advice <laughs> packed in there. The ones I heard were listen to your members, be flexible, yep. be willing to change. Don't recreate the wheel. Benefit from, from the experiences of those who've gone before you. Be open to collaborating uh, interprovincially as well as, as, well as uh, you know, pan-Canadian. So, yes. yeah, so I'm hearing lots of great words of advice there. And just do it. Yes. Well, <laughs> and even look at that. So, so was it Quebec or BC? I think uh, I think both of you somehow, um, one, of, one of you talked about replacement uh, reserve and investing as a group, right? Mm -hmm. If we did that nationally, right? I mean, just think about it. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. The strength and numbers. Think about what we'd be able to go get, right? So, I mean... There, to, to me, it's like there, there's so many benefits, like organizing Nova Scotia and, and cooperating with other, like I plan on going to BC and getting their set ready build course so we can give it in New Brunswick, right? Why would we recreate it? Just want to tweak it. I've already talked to BC and PHA about it. So sure. got to work together. Right. Yes, we're together. Okay, thank you, George. That was that was both informative and inspiring. Thank you so much. Kit, and, I'm, uh, I'm noticing we're almost out of time, but I want to make sure yeah. each of our panelists has an opportunity to offer some, some parting words of wisdom. Kit? I just wanted to uh, add very quickly, one of the uh, highlights that uh, we hear over and over again from uh, the uh, membership is our annual conference. Uh, they uh, feel that it is um, uh, uh, very valuable uh, networking opportunities, uh, educational uh, uh, sessions. Uh, we have our uh, a lot of the uh, suppliers uh, there on site as well, and uh, they enjoy it. It's a uh, it's a good time. We have a party, of course. We are uh, the Atlantic provinces, so we have to do that. Um, uh, yeah, so that has always been one of the uh, highlights of membership that we hear over and over again. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kit. Uh, Brian, just before we go to you, I'm just seeing uh, we're not going to get to all the questions in chat, but there is a question about transition housing. And Carolyn, what I can say is that the Build Together project has connected with the network of transition um, housing providers in the province. And certainly we've looked at um, housing for, for women and people leaving situations of uh, domestic violence as a key, a key group that needs to be considered in this discussion. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Brian, let's give the last word uh, to you from the panelists. Words of wisdom. Well, I'll, I'll be short. I mean, I'm just echoing uh, what everybody else has said, but just do it. I think it's, yeah, long overdue. And um, I think that there are just a ton of benefits for, for working together collectively. And um, yeah, I, I hope to see that process move forward. Okay. Thanks so much, Brian. And uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists this evening on, on behalf of the Center and, and on behalf of St. of X Extension. We're so thrilled to have you. We really appreciate your time and, and the, the wisdom and knowledge that you've brought to the discussion. 
And I just wanted to communicate to everyone out who's out there listening. We asked these folks one time and they all said yes. And they all came together really quickly to help us out with this process. So if that level of cooperation and collaboration is any indication of what we could do nationally, I think there's a tremendous power here to be harnessed. Uh, so, so thank you so much. We really appreciate uh, you being with us this evening. Renee, I'm going to give the last word to you. Well, thank you very much to the panelists, to the people who are participating to this to this uh, meeting today tonight. Um, I look forward to seeing the next steps. It's exciting to hear um, everything from the, the the different organizations and what decisions are going to be made moving forward. So, very excited about everything. Thank you so much. Great.